So we are back online for the very last talk of the summer for Thai Paris. And I have the pleasure to announce that Sumner Stone will be the speaker. So I have to introduce Sumner and I've, I've wrote a small text about you. Ah, even connected to Stefan. Um, Sumner is a crucial figure in the development of digital typeface. I have heard about Sumner Stone the first time back in the 90s in upper lower case. At the time, he just launched his own foundry, stone type foundry, and placed his ads on this magazine from ITC, um, upper and lower case, along with Matthew Carter, who launched also his uh, individual, individual foundry at the time. Um, at this moment, I bought uh, his book on ITC stones that he just signed a few days ago for me. Thank you, Sumner. Uh, a typeface that he designed with the help of the pre-version of Illustrator back in the 80s to interpolate weight. He will probably correct me about this detail. Uh, in the mid-80s, he was the first uh, director of typography at Adobe System, where he conceived and implemented uh, Adobe typographic program, including the Adobe Originals along with consulting on the development of Adobe type editing software. Without Sumner, we, never, we probably never have seen Trajan, Adobe Garamond, Caslon, Myriad as well, many great type designers hired by him, by Adobe, like Carol Tombley, Robert Slimbach, both recipients of the Charles Peignot Prize. Sumner was responsible for the for the, the development and invention of the Adobe Multiple Master Technology and during, directing his initial development, basis of today's new evolution called variab variable fonts. When I have launched, launched my foundry call at the time, Porsche Typo Foundry, this decision was directly influenced by his own stone type foundry. Um, it was my model as at the time, very few digital foundry have been launched. So when you have to launch a foundry, you have to have a proper name that people be able to recognize that it's a digital type foundry. So you have to follow certain way to spell the name of the foundry. Um, so now we have much more opportunity to find new words and people will get the point that it's type foundry, but not at the time. Um, so. Quickly, after we meet at ATP in Antwerpen in 1993, I asked him um, to use his end user license as a model for my version of my own end user license as nobody doing that in France at the time. I have to adapt to the French inte intellectual property code at the time. Um, I also hired uh, Sumner to design um, a specific version of his stone typeface for Le Monde newspaper where I was at the time. In 95, I invited him to speak at the Rencontre Interna Internationale de Lure in south of France. Then uh, in 2012, with Caradi Eduardo, uh, they invited me to join Type Cooper for, to teach for five weeks, to which I invent, uh, invent invited Stefan to join us. So Sumner is not only a colleague, a mentor for me, he's a good friend since many years. Someone like, someone you like to spend time with, simple as that. Please welcome Summerstone for the last time talk of the season. Thank you, Jean-Francois. I spent the day um, looking at the uh, Type Paris 2017 students' projects, which you can may have already seen up on the board. Uh, and I um, want to uh, 
uh, compliment them on their work. Um, this program, which um, is really modeled on the program that uh, I helped to start up at Cooper Union in New York, uh, is a five-week marathon in which you start making type and you don't get to sleep until it's over. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> it is a wonderful thing to participate in because you really, I think almost everyone who, d who does this uh, surprises themselves by what they can accomplish in five weeks. And um, <clears throat> so uh, it was a real pleasure to see um, see the things that people have made and how much uh, they've done in, in this time. And um, so I, I want to, um, it, it's always difficult to come in at the end of these projects and, um, and critique the work. I think it's, it's of, of all, you know, it, I, I would, um, have people come into my classes that I taught at Cooper and the toughest thing was to for it come in right at the end when you, you really, you know, what are you going to say? Well, throw it out and start over. Um, you're not going to say that. Um, and Thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so I, one of the things that, um, that you wind up thinking about when you get to the end of this process is what next? Because like, you cannot do an entire family of typefaces in this time and finish it. You can make a start on, you can make a, a, a Roman typeface, for example, and then make an, an italic or part of an italic, part of a bold, maybe a black. Or, and a few people um, actually get farther than that. They may make an italic and a bold and so on. And, um, <clears throat> But uh, inevitably, um, there is a stage when you begin thinking, okay, so what, what, el what am I going to do? What else is there to add to this family? And uh, it's a part of typeface design that I have um, tried to explore and think about uh, ever since the first family that I did. So I'm going to focus, and Jean-Francois Jean asked me to talk about my work, I'm going to focus on uh, this specific talk of topic that is in my work. And I can't even show you all of the sort of relevant wrinkles that go along with this, but that's, that's going to be my main um, focus. Okay, so we will now start this guy. Okay, so, oh, it's not, it's not doing that. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. Okay, so I, I have, um, I've done a pretty good variety of different kinds of type. Uh, uh, this little keepsake is um, a, a kind of a choosing of, uh, for the sake of variety so that you can see that um, all my typefaces do not look the same. Um, and I want to show you, uh, give you a little introduction to uh, what got me into doing this strange thing because I think that's always a story. Type designers until very recently were not trained in academic institutions. There was no course in type design up until maybe a little over uh, 12, 14 years ago when the type design programs, we now really have two primary ones where you can get a degree and those are at the University of Reading in England and also in, uh, in The Hague, there is a program. And now at Cooper Union, there is another program, but it's not really a degree granting situation and it's shorter and so on. But it, it does, and I did teach in that, and it does offer a, an entry into the type design world. 
Yeah. Okay. Um, that's a bit. Oh, yeah. Directly, directly into it. I get it. Okay. Um, so, um, <clears throat> this is a calligraphy that I did in um, the 1970s uh, in connection with uh, publicity for a group called the Friends of Calligraphy in the San Francisco Bay Area. They have published a, um, a journal for many years called Alphabet, some of which uh, have, and met, there have been many different editors, and some of these um, have done an extremely fine job in putting this journal out. If you ever have a chance to look at them, uh, some of them are quite fine. But in the very beginning, I did um, uh, pretty much all the posters, and this is part of one of the posters for a talk. Uh, and uh, this was silk screened. I did silk screen and letterpress posters in my print shop. Um, uh, this was uh, done about the same time um, in the 70s when I was living in Sonoma, which is in the wine country north of San Francisco, and I did quite a bit of work for uh, the wine industry. Uh, this was, uh, you know, actually a restaurant, and um, there was a, a publication at the time called Fine Print, which was also published in San Francisco, which was about um, mostly American, not exclusively American, fine printing, and uh, was uh, very beautifully printed by letterpress, had articles by the people who were typographers and book designers and printers, and I wrote articles for them. And when they had their 10th anniversary, um, the editor asked a, a number of us to do uh, some kind of piece of lettering or calligraphy to go in the issue. So this is my sketch for the piece that wound up in that issue. Uh, that what, This was pencil. This is um, uh, pen and ink. And here's the printed version from the journal. Uh, I, I really uh, kind of fell in love with the notion of making outline forms uh, during that period. And so I did quite a few of them. And this is um, one of them uh, that I have then since kind of explored as a, a digitized object. Um, and my entry into digital t type um, started in the late 70s when I went to work for a company called Autologic, which made the, the, really the first successful digital typesetting machine, used mostly by newspapers and very high volume printers. And uh, at that time, uh, in 1985, um, there was a, uh, actually, I think it was 1983 was the original, was the conference. There was a conference uh, at Stanford University about digital type, and it was called um, The Computer and the Hand in Type Design, organized by Chuck Bigelow, who was, um, uh, became a, a teacher there. And I did this logotype for the conference. Um, Don Knuth, who um, is a very famous computer scientist, um, was uh, interested in typography and he developed some computer tools. One of them is called Metafont, which you write code in order to make letters. And the other one is called um, Tech, Tau Epsilon Chi, Tech. Tech is still very widely used for all kinds of technical typesetting. If you're gonna set math, you use tech. And it has many, many users all over the world. And they have a, a users group, a tech users group, it's called Tugboat. <laughs> anyway, so uh, Knuth actually wrote an article about uh, my letter A, which he thought was quite odd. Um, this was another job that I've done a couple of projects with a fine printer in San Francisco, the Arion uh, Press, and they printed a Bible a few years back, and 
uh, asked me if I would do these re initial re letters, um, that big I, and this is all set in Romulus, one of Jan van Krimpen's typefaces. And um, these are the initial letters for each book of the Bible. In uh, 1984, I went to work for Adobe. Uh, and they hired me to be the director of their typographic program. And um, they had already made versions of these three typefaces when I arrived. They uh, started out by having the wives of the um, initial employees of the company digitize Times, Helvetica, and Courier. They then realized that they needed to hire somebody who might, might give them more uh, professional information and expertise. Uh, so these are not those original versions. <clears throat> um, but uh, it, I, 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 I think that they didn't really realize the implications in the beginning uh, of what they were doing. I, I, was, number, I was employee number 25. Uh, at Adobe, and I then went about hiring people to produce type. But the laser writer, which is, was where these typefaces first resided, was the first postscript printer to make it into the light of day. It was Apple's first printer that was not a dot matrix printer. They didn't have any laser printer before that. And it cost $7,000 in 1985 dollars to buy one of these things and they could not make them fast enough. It was, it just flew off the shelves. It was a huge hit and along with the Mac and along with PageMaker, which you could make up pages which in, the, in what we call WYSIWYG at the time, what you see is what you get. Um, completely changed the whole graphic design industry. It took a few years, but how many of you work on a Macintosh? How many of you work on a computer? Almost everybody. So, uh, it just, it, it changed everything. It changed everything pretty fast. <laughs> and I have met, uh, as I've traveled around the country giving talks and workshops, I have met people who teach in graphic design programs in colleges and universities in America, and a, a good number of the people who are teaching there were people who were the early adopters of the, who bought the little, first little Macs and, you know, put up with all the wrinkles and made graphic design. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things to notice about these three typefaces is that they don't really seem to relate to one another <laughs> at all. <laughs> and they were chosen because Times was the most popular serif typeface. Helvetica was, the, and this is from, from data from Linotype. Helvetica the most popular sans, and Courier was the most popular typewriter typeface. I'm not sure where they, how they determined that. Um, it's interesting that these were the three categories that they thought were significant. Serif, sans, and typewriter. And a mon a typewriter meant monospace, which is a big deal in the world of people who write code. Um, and I, ha I could give a, a half hour lecture on that, but I'm not going to. <laughs> but in any case, um, so, so I, I, I actually think that the choice of Helvetica, uh, which was already very popular, no question about it, but I think that the choice of putting that on the computer, especially the very first time, um, really boosted Helvetica up to a new level and was a kind of, a, put a cap on the phenomenon of the sans serif world that we now live in. And it just created a kind of momentum for the sans and not necessarily for Helvetica anymore. There are so many competitors, uh, but I think that that had a significant effect. I think there are other reasons too, but that's one of them. So I want to give you a little history before I go into my first typeface family of what uh, typeface families are about. 
Uh, this is uh, a, um, an election poster from a wall in Pompeii. It was made, and we know that it was made in 79 AD because it's advertising people who were a candidate in that year, in the year that Vesuvius buried them. <laughs> so the interesting thing about this is that there are two styles. There's the style of the huge letters, which is a kind of a smoking gun to, that really helps to understand and believe the theory that Edward Cadditch had about the imperial Roman capitals in particular, the ones that uh, were used on the inscription at the bottom of Trajan's column. Because uh, they're clearly made with a brush and they're not exactly like the imperial Roman letters, but they're damn close. And um, they have at the bottom of them, you know, these symmetric serifs, which it turns out Kadich, if you're not familiar with his work, uh, was trained as a sign painter as a young man. And he saw these things and he just said, I, I know how those were made. Well, that was not the theory at the time about why these letters had serifs and a particular kind of serif. Um, and then below them, you see what we now call the, uh, the, the rustic style, the um, rustica. And that was also written with a brush. Quite, you can see it quite clearly. And it could have, it could, this could have been written with another edge tool, like a pen, if it were on a different surface. But this is a rough wall. You have to write with a brush. So um, <coughs> those two styles are part of the same message. They're part of the same poster. They are used together. This configuration happens on many Roman inscriptions, um, especially in like first and second century AD, where you have the headline in a, in a formal Roman letter, and then the text is in a less formal letter. They're not always these kind of rustics. Uh, the rustic is a style which varies quite a bit. But here we have, you know, uh, first century AD, we have people mixing typefaces together. So it's an old tradition. And it's interesting that this happens in, in our tradition, the Roman tradition, because it doesn't really happen that often in other writing systems. Um, it happens in um, Japanese, they have uh, kana. They have uh, these um, simplified phonetic characters that are really based on a more cursive style. They have two styles of them, and they get set right in the text. And so th that's a, an example. But um, uh, in the Arabic tradition, for example, I, and in the uh, um, Egyptian tradition, this doesn't really seem to have happened very often. The mostly, you just see one style. And that style is regarded as being appropriate for the thing you're doing. Uh, but it's not like they get mixed together. So here we go. This is now, um, I believe this is from uh, the 11th century. And how many styles do we have? On the top, I'm going to use the pointer here. On the top. No. Where's the, oh, there. Um, back. What happened? Um, just bear with me for one second. Okay, so that style is called uncial, U N C I L. Um, the the text is set in what we now referred to as the Carolingian minuscule. This was a result of 
uh, Charlemagne, the Emperor Charlemagne, declaring that uh, we were going to get everybody to write the same way. And um, basically, the people who wrote formal letters were mostly in monasteries. And the way this worked was there was one monastery where they started doing this and they sent manuscripts. And before too long, it worked. They, they, they're pretty much Charlemagne's whole what had been his kingdom. They were all writing this style as, as the main text style. Uh, and this style is what was revived in the Italian Renaissance and is the precursor of our lowercase letters. So it, it was a very good choice, we think. Uh, and, um, and it has had a, a very strong effect. Okay, and then the admissum and the super oblata and the post-communion, those uh, are in a kind of an unch a, a, a rustic style, which was the same style we saw on the bottom of the election poster. On the left, you have these filled-in letters, which are um, a, usually called versals. They begin a verse. But those are really based on the imperial Roman letters. They're, they're kind of a, a, a simplification of them. Uh, and these are a little narrow, but that's where they come from. And this thing up in the left, the big S, what a wonderful thing that is. I think that can be pretty directly traced to the Irish. This is the Irish made exquisite manuscripts, but they also did a lot of metal work. They developed letter forms which are, had this braid effect. And then a bunch of them went to Europe as basically missionaries to convert people and to establish monasteries. And the effect of that in those monasteries that had scriptoriums was that we still have a lot of stuff that really can be traced back to those Irish uh, and English manuscripts, which happened in like 6th, 7th century. So here we have what? One, two, three, four, really five styles if you count the initial letter. Okay. So um, yeah. This is a, a famous type specimen. It's called the Eganoff Berner specimen, and it's from 1592. Uh, and it shows the uh, re actual typefaces of Claude Garamond. And it also shows italic by Grandjean, Robert Grandjean. Uh, and um, you can see, uh, if you look down here at the you know, third paragraph down where it says Romain Gros, text de Guerremont. You look one, two, three on the bottom line. What are those things? Small capitals. Small capitals. And then when you look at 16th century books, small capitals are everywhere. They love them. So here we have, you know, we have uh, an italic, we have a Roman, we have the capitals and the lower case, which don't really start to be used together until pretty late on in the, in the, what they, the, in the beginning of the 16th century. And we have Greek. <laughs> All of them obviously to be used together. That's the way they're displayed in the specimen. We now have um, a, a number of examples of typefaces in which we, what we call super families. And super families refer to typefaces which uh, contain things that are beyond uh, what we have normally considered to be a family. And what a family was is what really, you know, you found on the menu, uh, the font menu 
Uh, in the beginning, you get Roman, you get Italic, you get bold, you get bold Italic. That's kind of the standard issue family. The bold Italic is actually a late comer. Uh, but uh, this is all the way back to the early 20th century. This was designed by this wonderful Dutch designer, Jan van Krimpen, for, and, and um, he uh, made a sans serif typeface to go with his serif typeface that already existed. He also made a Greek, uh, but the sans serif typeface never got produced. It, it, you know, it just sort of petered out, didn't happen. It looks a heck of a lot like Gil Sands, I have to say. Um, and it was made after Gil Sands. <laughs> so he, that might have had something to do with it. Uh, on the other hand, if you take any um, traditional Roman typeface, which and, and this is definitely a traditional typeface of his above, and you take, you make it into a sans serif, it has a real tendency to look a lot like Gil Sands. <laughs> or if you, if you don't quite take all of the serifs off, then it looks like Optima. <laughs> so um, this is the background for um, my making. <laughs> the stone superfamily, which consisted of Three main typefaces, serif and sans serif, but also uh, something that I called informal. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more. So here they are. This is the way they appeared when they were announced in upper and lower case, which uh, Jean-Francois mentioned. Uh, and I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly, but um, here the serif is used up on the top and then the sans serif, this is a, a uh, wonderful um, natural history guide of birds uh, done by a man named Sibley who did these fabulous drawings. Um, here is a guide for Yosemite. This is using primarily the um, serif typeface. Uh, here is a no number of European newspapers adopted these typefaces and used them. This one is a German newspaper. And then um, uh, by the very kind action of um, Gudrun Zopf, uh, it got used in the Gutenberg Jahrbuch two years in a row. This is the informal type that they used on the spine. And this is what the interior of that looks like. Looks like. So it's got the informal type as a headline and then the serif type for the text and then the sans serif type is used in the captions. Uh, this is a, a high school um, textbook uh, for French students. Um, this is, an, I'm not gonna actually talk about that. Okay, this is a, a Roman newspaper. It's from 1998. This is L'Unita was the communist newspaper. And I thought, well, the reason they chose my typeface was because it sort of all gets along with each other. <laughs> and they use all three versions in, in the newspaper. The whole newspaper pretty much set in it. Uh, not anymore, of course. But uh, here's a Dutch railway uh, brochure using the serif type. Here's a stamp using the sans. Uh, and this publication is a thing that I bought for my daughter when she was young. Uh, it's called Click Magazine, and it uses all three typefaces. A serif on the top. How can that be? Somebody is calling me. All right, so... Um, and then it's the, the sans is used for the um, byline and the informal is used for the text. And they actually use this typeface through the whole magazine, except for the cover, which uses one of Matthew Carter's, one of Matthew Carter's typefaces. <laughs> uh, here is the italic, the serif italic. And um, these guys who make this homeopathic medicine use my typefaces on almost all their products, which I always love when I go into the store and see them. 
This is very recent. This was in um, the um, historical, the Art Historical Museum in Vienna. I just took it, you know, a little over a week ago. Uh, that's the sans serif typeface. And then this is the, the labels in that same museum, which also uses um, the sans serif. And this is in the, what's called the Carriage Museum in Vienna. It's actually quite a wonderful museum. And they had these also using the sans serif typeface. Um, this is uh, walking on the street in uh, Amsterdam, where I was right before I came here, that the Steenhauers means something about bricks, <laughs> brick layers or something like that. And I couldn't find what the top word meant. I, I have a feeling that might have something to do with scaffolding. <laughs> um, anyway, so, one of the wonderful things that happened with this typeface was that I, I was approached by a, a, a very wild character who lived up in Vancouver, BC and about doing a metal version of the typeface. And he had purchased the remains of the American Monotype Company and had all their equipment. It didn't all work. <laughs> but he hired a mechanical engineer and he got a lot of it to work. And he sent me... Um, this and we actually, using the punch cutting machine, cut a capital H. And so the capital H that's uh, on the bottom was printed letterpress from those metal H's that we cast on the monotype machine. And the top is on the laser printer. <clears throat> we did a... Uh, uh, I actually had Carol Twombly do this, uh, a, a version of the typeface that was meant for display. So it has much thinner thins, it's much more sort of elegant looking, and um, it got used on this manual, it got used a bunch of other t places but uh, for in-house publications, but we, um, it, it never got put up for sale. This was my advisory board at Adobe, and the joke about this is that what happens to you when you come to California. Uh, there's, um, uh, starting on the bottom row, that's Alvin Eisenman, who was the head of the graphic design program at Yale, me, Jack Stoffaker, one of the fine printers in San Francisco, Lance Heidi, very fine designer of books and posters, um, this guy you might know, Roger Black, and uh, up there is a guy who worked for WGBH in Boston for many, many years, and his name will come to me right after I change the slide. Uh, this was our logo type. Um, I t had a discussion with the, the guys who were the founders of the company when they asked me to join them. I said, well, I will do this on the condition that you will fund the making of or new original typefaces. And they looked at me like, well, of course, you know. They were from uh, Xerox Park, a research institution. They believed in innovation. And they, I think they thought it was rather silly of me to even ask them that. But in fact, they were true to their word. They were very happy to have us develop new typefaces, and so we did. And um, uh, I initially did the stone typefaces, and at that time, we did not, Adobe did not sell any retail products. Their, their whole business was in licensing PostScript, the language, and a, an interpreter that went in printers or image setters, and that was it. And those, a lot of those guys who worked on that didn't want to be in the retail business, but they did it anyway, and they did it because of Illustrator. And Illustrator was uh, developed from the software that we made for editing the fonts. Because once you can move Bezier's around, you've basically got the hardest part done. Uh, this is Trajan. Um, the Trajan story you can read on a blog on my website. Um, <clears throat> 
uh, so I'm not going to go into it. But the, the reason I made this was because um, of an ad, which was actually run by Linotype, um, which uh, said something like English Helvetica. It was set in Gil Sands. <laughs> This is the Adobe Garamond, one of the first typefaces we did. Robert Slimbach designed it. Uh, the, the Trajan was uh, drawn by uh, Carol Twombly. Of course, both of these typefaces, we really tried to be as accurate as we could about making them close to the original typefaces. And that was highly dependent in the case of the Trajan typeface on the research that was done by Edward Kadich on the Trajan inscription, which, you know, these remarkable books, including one called The Origin of the Seraph. Uh, when I left Adobe, uh, I, and Jean-Francois wanted me to say a few words about it, what it was like to deal with uh, being uh, in charge of the whole typographic program at Adobe, because it did really change my perspective on, on making typefaces in many ways, because I, I felt like I was responsible for trying to figure out, well, what do we need? What are we going to make? You know, what, what is the market? The market was completely changing. And basically, a huge new user group for type. And that has continued right up to the present day. And in fact, I think the reason that we have so much interest in typography and type in the graphic design world uh, now is, um, you know, uh, a, a direct result of everybody having the ability to look at typefaces and choose them and make them. And I, I know a lot of people, some of them are parents of my, my uh, daughter's friends who teach at the university where I live, who have nothing to do with design or typography, but they are absolutely fascinated by typefaces. They're like, you know, type geeks, somehow amateur type geeks. <laughs> so I left Adobe, I started Stone Type Foundry, and this was my original logo type that I used on the labels. These were labels that went for floppy disks because there was no internet. We, I sold stuff by mail order. The first uh, typeface that I did for um, the Stone Type Foundry was a commission which I got from Print Magazine. It was a typeface for the text of Print Magazine. And the idea which was presented to me was that they wanted to make, they wanted to have a typeface that would take up less space because they wanted more room to put illustrations in the magazine. And so I said, okay, fine, we're gonna make a condensed typeface, but I wanna make sure that we don't make a typeface that's so condensed that it's hard to read. And these guys who, at that time, who ran print were all writers. They were not designers, they were writers. And so they were quite receptive to not having their words, you know, be difficult to read. So th this is a thing that which I was talking to the students about today is that the process that I went through in order to arrive at these shapes was to, to keep making them a little bit more condensed, a little bit more condensed until I thought it's broken. And I think that's a very valuable thing to do in all kinds of design is to find where the limits are. You know, get, get to the extreme, break it, and then you know you can back up a little bit and you'll be okay. Um, I did do some, what I considered to be tricks, which was, uh, for example, I made the, um, and, and the main thing that I was competing with, I thought, was uh, there were two typefaces that were my competition. One of them was Times Roman, which if you at that time went and looked through magazines, probably more than half the magazines were set in Times. The other ones were mostly sent in the same typeface that was used in print at that time, which was called Century Old Style. Century Old Style and Times. 
Times is a little bit more compact than Century Old Style, but not very much. Century Old Style is right up there. So that was the reason that these guys, th these, it's the same reason why most paperbacks were printed in Times Roman, because you can read it, but it takes up less space than Germán, for example, or the sort of traditional text typefaces in general. So that was, my goal was to beat times <laughs> in being compact. I made, and one of the things, if you look at times, that's, that's kind of funny, and it's, it's based on, 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 to a certain extent, on Plantin. You can look at that, too. There is writing about this. Is that the, the, uh, the round characters, like the O, C, and E, are, are pretty round. They're, they're, they're big, they're wide. The H, M, and N, and U, are narrow. So I thought, OK, well, why don't we make, the, particularly the E for English is the most common letter. If we make that narrow, that's a win. So um, I also did some other things like I thought, well, the more um, space we can capture inside the letter forms, the more legible this will be. Even though we're squeezing it this way, Let's try to capture more space. So I made for the H and the N are curved. If you look at the serifs, the serifs are heavier on the outside than they are on the inside. That was all about trying to capture more space. This is the cover of the, of the magazine when the typeface was introduced. And I have a funny little thing to say about this, but I'm going to skip it. <laughs> and this is the inside of the magazine um, when they started using, using the type. This is the, the bold version of the type and used in a little publication that I put out, which now seems rather odd to me. But, um, and this is an article by the type, Swiss type uh, designer and scholar, Max Karflisch, um, and uh, it's in it's in German, <laughs> but um, uh, very very nice article, and so that really was, um, although it was the first typeface that I made after I left Adobe, I thought, okay, well. What I really want to do is I want to make a big family of typefaces uh, that includes nar narrower and wider versions and also includes type typefaces that are made for specific sizes. So um, I embarked on that project and I actually thought it was probably a really good idea to do the condensed one first. You know, there aren't that many condensed serif typefaces. The one that you see all the time is ITC Garamon Condensed. It's a wretched typeface, pardon my saying so. The guy who designed that typeface is really good. Um, but um, it, it's too narrow, you know, and you see stuff set in it and it's kind of irritating. But it gets used all the time because it's, it's been around and there it is. So I, these were sketches I did. So the, this stuff on the right is, you know, my, my initial drawings for the stone typeface. And you can see, you know, at some point it was, it had this really nice curve on the inside. This one is less curved. But then I made a wider, a wider version. But I was still retaining that uh, configuration of the serifs where they're thinner on the inside. And then I did... Um, you know, a, a grid of interpolation of both weight and width. So you see uh, going from, you know, from the top to the bottom, you see wide to narrow, and then left to right, you're seeing increase in weight. Uh, this was really while I was developing the print typeface, I did this. And I, I was very interested in the time at making typographic systems, about the use of interpolation. Interpolation was uh, a thing that we 
explored. I, as Jean-Francois said, I was uh, the one who uh, thought up and proposed to Adobe the, what's called the multiple master system, which some of you may not even know about. But it basically, the idea was that you could make a typeface that you would deliver as a product and then the end user could choose any of the points in between the extremes of the typeface and make that into a font that you could use. Uh, for various reasons, um, um, Adobe gave up on it. I, I left, that was the initial problem. But then um, there, were, there were all sorts of reasons why it was not very well accepted. Uh, I think the primary reason was simply that um, the user interface was difficult to use. There were bugs. Uh, it wasn't built into anything. You actually had to have a separate application to make it work. And then um, there wasn't really much attempt to give people guidance about how to use it or why you might want to use it and so on. So it died. Now it has come back in the form of what Jean-Francois said, what are called variable fonts, which have now been uh, put into the spec for OpenType. And if we're lucky, we might actually get to make some. <laughs> One of the things that I was interested in because of the print typeface was the relationship between line length and letter width. And so these are a, a narrow letter on, on the left and a shorter line length, but the, the, the number of character, the words in, in all of these are the same. Um, so I, this was one of the little experiments that I did. Here it's, you get some even wider ones. Um, I, I do actually think that um, there's something to the notion of having a relatively condensed type to use for narrow columns because you, you get a better breaks. Basically, you can fit more characters on a line. It gives you a little bit more flexibility. Okay, so I then uh, decided I would make a typeface that was really intended for books. Uh, it's called Cycles. And Cycles was going to be the wider version of, the wider version of print but also with the additional features of being made for different sizes. And what I thought was, uh, why don't I make just things that are targeted for the traditional metal, some traditional metal sizes? So that's what I did. I made 5 point, 7 point, 9 point, 11 point, 18 point, 24 point, 36 point. Um, and he, these typefaces, um, so there, there you can see the kinds of changes that I made uh, in, in just these characters uh, going on the left from, uh, so there it goes 11, 9, 7, 5. And, you know, the, the basic drill is if you look at what has been done historically, is you have less contrast as you get uh, smaller, uh, you have um, a bigger X height, and you uh, make it a little heavier. So, so what you, and also what you realize is that the, that the amount of change between a, a one point size and, and the next uh, increases as you get smaller, because the difference between nine and 10 point is what, 10%. The difference between five and six point is much bigger. It's much bigger. So it, you know, as, as you go down in size, you have to sort of exaggerate things more in order to make them work. Uh, one of the uh, early publications that was done with cycles was this journal, which I edited for the A Type I, uh, it took me an entire year to do this. And then I did another issue, which took me about a year and a half. And I figured at that rate, um, you know, 
it was gonna be tough to do them. So those, we have two issues of this journal. Uh, here's another pretty early um, use of the typeface and there's a, a really good designer, book designer and exhibition designer and just generally graphic designer at Stanford and uh, she did this beautiful cover. And then Alvin Eisenman who was on the type advisory board and was, had, had retired uh, from his position at Yale was asked to design this journal, the Journal of the American Academy of Arts and Scientists, Sciences, and he wanted to use my type. And the, actually, the Daedalus is, is a, a one of a kind thing, that's hand lettered, uh, but in the style of the typeface. And then uh, he did this marvelous um, design for, for the journal. And, uh, they're still using the typefaces. The journal has changed a little bit in the design, but not a lot. And um, I, I, they send it to me for free because <laughs> I didn't really get paid very much to do it. But I have been reading Daedalus now for, I don't know. So this is 07, so at least 10 years, but it was earlier than that. So then um, I, I felt like I really needed to make a, a, a typeface that was in part of this cycles family that, but that was really for display, very specifically for display, bigger than 36 point. And so I embarked on this project to make a repo. And here, this is a repo italic. These are the original pencil drawings. Here's the type used on, on a book jacket. Um, and here it is used, uh, printed letterpress, the, the Roman, and the italic, and then some, some designers who have done really nice things with this. Um, this is um, done um, by Henrik Berkvig, a Danish designer. Henrik did this one also. And then this was done by a man named Robert Dalrymple, who is um, a, wo a wonderful book designer and mostly does um, museum catalogs and he told me that he has cornered the market for museum catalogs in Scotland. I went up to visit him in Edinburgh and yeah, he, he does really beautiful. This is also his. And then this it was done uh, by a fine press in uh, San Francisco uh, in California, Northern California and um, it's it's the it's a, basically a tribute to this man, Wallace Stegner, who is one of our beloved uh, authors. And I'm not gonna tell that whole story, New Year's card. And then this one and some of the following ones are done by another really good book designer named um, Cameron Poulter, who does a lot, who is in Chicago, does work for the University of Chicago Press and some other university presses. And uh, the reason that I'm not showing you much of uh, text is because text is hard to show on the screen. <laughs> it's, it's hard, you know, it's, uh, you, you can't really see much. So these are all done um, also by Cameron. He, he really likes the typeface and he even talked me into doing uh, some extra characters for him. Um, but he always sends me these things, the book jackets. And so then I, I decided later on, actually fairly recently, to do a version of a repo that's an inline. And this was my announcement of it. And then this was a few little things I put together just for advertising it. and. Stanley Morrison did, in fact, write a book called Letter Forms, but this is not the cover of it. <laughs> it's a fake. Then I did a swash version of this typeface, which you cannot buy yet. Um, okay. So um, in the late 90s, uh, I did, had an exhibition at the San Francisco Public Library. 
Uh, these are the pencil drawings for the uh, repo caps up in that strip above. That, that's the t actual typeface below. And um, as a result, they asked me to design a logotype for them. They had just moved into a new building and they had had a logotype designed by one of the firms in San Francisco and they did not like it. And they asked me if I, and this exhibition that I had in their new building was attended by more people than any exhibition they had ever had. That's why they asked me to do the logotype, I think. <laughs> anyway, this was the logotype. And I designed, as part of it, a, a typeface, which is, again, really part of this same Cycles family. Its uh, intent was that the people in the library could use it for making flyers, making posters, doing the newsletter, correspondence. And so I tried to make it very simple uh, and I wrote a manual for them, and they're still using it uh, at the library. There it is. Flyer. Another flyer. And this is part of their newsletter. How are we doing on the time here, John? Okay, I'm, I'm going to skip most of this one, but um, I, I will go through a little bit of it quickly. Um, th this is uh, an ancient Greek inscription. This is on the base of a statue by a famous sculptor, Greek sculptor Praxiteles. And notice that there's this interesting swelling of the strokes. The strokes get uh, heavier towards the ends. They, they, and this turns out to be um, a feature of some Roman typefaces. This one is in Rome still. It's an interesting one. I'm not going to say a lot about these. And then it became also something that happened during the Italian Renaissance, mostly in Florence, although some other parts of Tuscany have some of these letters too, and mostly in um, uh, in ecclesiastical settings, in churches or in baptistries or other places like that. And it is the thing that inspired Hermann Zaff to do Optima, these letter forms. Um, there is a typeface that precedes Optima that I think must have been inspired by the same thing, which was done by a man named R. Hunter, Hunter Middleton who was the type director at the Ledlow Company for many years. And he did this typeface called Stellar, which I've always liked. Uh, and here are Herman's sketches for Optima, which he did on Italian banknotes because Italian banknotes in 1950 were basically worthless. <laughs> so there's Optima. Okay, I'm not going to talk about this one at all. Uh, and I'm not going to talk about that one. But I made a typeface that has swelling stems, a sans serif typeface. It does not have thick and thin parts the way Optima does, but it has these swelling stems. And you can see here the, the uh, basis of the widths of the type, the proportions of the typeface looking like Trajan and uh, Adobe Guerlain. fix this. Here's a, a letterpress printing in, here's one, another one by Robert Dalrymple. I did do a Greek, although you can't buy it. Uh, and this is by a woman named Susan Skarsgård, wonderful designer, and calligrapher. And this was um, an announcement for the most recent version of the typeface. And I, there, in New York, uh, I guess two years ago now, maybe three, Monotype put on an exhibition uh, in the AIGA, AIGA gallery. And in it was this, this thing that's on the top. It turns out that uh, Dan Radigan, who was mostly responsible for putting on this exhibition, spent a lot of time prowling through the Monotype archives of 
type drawings, and he found this. And this was a typeface that Eric Gill proposed for Monotime to make after Gill. Well, it looks a hell of a lot like my typeface. <laughs> and uh, so I, I found that to be absolutely fascinating. And, and what Dan thought was that he just took Gill and whited out stuff, which could be. It kind of looks that way. This is the lowercase. And um, so these are some alternate characters in the typeface. I, I put in, you know, um, single story A and G and also this uncial E. Um, and then I did a whole uncial typeface which is compatible with magma in that it has the same weights. You can, you can actually substitute character by character uh, these uncial characters into magma. And I got, kind of got off on that whole idea. So here's, you know, at the top is pure magma, at the bottom is pure monk. Uh, M-U-N-C is actually an archaic word for M-O-N-K in English. And, um, and then in between are combinations of the two. So this was a thing which um, really struck me and I carried it through to another typeface which is this one, which is called Numa, which is based on the very early Roman inscriptions, of which there are only a tiny number. Uh, the number of typefaces, uh, the number of inscriptions that we have, and this is up till a couple of years ago, I don't know if any have been discovered recently, but um, before uh, 400 is 10, 10 inscriptions. But they have these interesting experimental, obviously what were at the time kind of experimental characters, like those A's, which, you know, I passed up, but, you know, here, here they are. Those are the A's with the crossbar kind of thing. And this fascinating O, which is not joined at the bottom. The Greeks had two O's, you know, they had Omega and O Micron. Omicron and Omega. Omega was the big one. Omicron was the small one. That meant short and long, basically. And so I, I wonder if this was a kind of a compromise to maybe try to make those two shapes into one O. These are the experimental letters that, um, that we have. The M that persists quite on into even Roman, the earliest Roman uh, inscription in stone, the, the Forum Sippus, has an M that looks a lot like that. The, the angular C, so what happened, you know, as, as the Greek letters get adopted by the Romans, one of the primary things that happens to the forms is that these angular shapes get rounded. So the Roman let, alphabet has many more round shapes in it than this ancient Greek. And there's a, there are a lot, of, lot to be said about this. My original type sketches for the typeface, uh, all done in one morning. I just said, okay, now I'm gonna make this into a typeface. I did this typeface in about three weeks. And here again is a mixture. At the top is the pure pneuma at the bottom is a pure magma and in between is a mixture. So you can mix these things together character by character. And here's a, a wonderful book title done by this uh, fabulous designer at Stanford, Becky Fishbach. And I, I just love this thing that she did. And this was for an exhibition about artist books done by this guy. So here's a few things. Okay, thank you very much. Um, any question for Sam Stone? Yes, this one. Hello. Um, so I noticed in that 
photo of, I think it was the early Adobe team. It was all men. Um, and so I wanted to know if you've noticed um, a progression in more women leading or De in definitely. more leading Definitely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he, he, uh, uh, Carl Tomley as uh, one of the yeah. most great designer I know. So that's the two first designer he hired was a woman and a man. Yeah. We had, okay. we had I'm sorry to answer for you. 50% women in the first designers I hired, but there were only two of them. <laughs> 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 no, there has definitely been a, an increase in the number of uh, women who are type designers. Um, thank goodness. It's a long history of males, but, you know, uh, it's interesting to read that there were, I, and I only recently have been seeing this research, there were yeah, entire scriptoria in the Middle Ages that were entirely women, and they did these beautiful manuscripts, and they're discovering more and more of this now, that there are women doing the research. So. <laughs> Great, thank you. Yeah. More question? It's late. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Are, are you, you're not yes. done yet? There is one more question, yeah? No? Yeah, I was thinking that you wanted to ask a question, so yes, you? Just a short question. Uh, what do you think of the recent trend of uh, responsive typography? Because you were, you imagine it uh, back then in the day, but. Well, it's very good to hear Stefan explain the, you know, the actual guts of how that gets done, and um, I, you know, it's it's obviously necessary to do. It's just necessary to do. I mean, you, what what are you going to do? You you've got to have a design that works on all these different devices. You just have to have it. So um, the 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 variable fonts were to a certain extent um, motivated by the notion that you could have a typeface that you could expand and contract to fit the column width. Uh, that is kind of, you know, it's, it just doesn't work when you have, you're going from, you know, the iPhone size to the big screen. It doesn't work. But it was an interesting thing that that helped to, to motivate this innovation and the ability to make multiple mass, basically interpolatable fonts. And, um, I'm happy they're back. I hope that we get to make them. But yeah, it's you know, it's it's an obviously it's a, it's an important thing and and strategies for how to do it, which I think was very interesting here. Stefan's strategy about how he went about it. Um, th those are important. You know, you. Um, I I have done my website so that you can actually reduce the whole page. Uh, down on the iPhone and you can pretty much still read it. So that's another much simpler but not nearly as good strategy. It's not, it wouldn't be good for reading the news, for example. Wouldn't be good for reading the news, for example. But um, that, that problem is not going to go away. You know, we're going to just have to deal with it. So. Could, could you um, have um, a tip for the people work on the variable font to make that successful, that it wasn't the case with the multiple master. What you learned from these um, problems of, be, you, you refer to the user or, or yes. Yeah, I, what I, what I, mistakes they don't have to do to make the variable fonts? Well, the, the variable fonts are potentially useful in that situation. It's just that you know, the, the expectation that you can have a headline and then you can get it to fit simply by having a much narrower font on a small screen, that's somewhat unrealistic. But I, I am working on a typeface that has an extremely narrow version and an extremely wide version and, and multiple weights. And, and so, you know, it could be used for such a thing. And, and um, there, if you look online and look at the stuff that's been written about the variable fonts, David Burlow did a whole bunch of uh, kind of sample 
things you know that you can look at and they're they're very interesting um, does this does this mean that the user don't have to realize that the typeface have different widths or different weights because when we look yeah, to multiple the, the end user never sees any of this this is just all happens yeah, automatically yeah, yeah. So if we compare to multiple masters, in multiple masters, the user, the graphic designer, have to select the, the, the ways he wants. On, on this, in this case, as you describe, it's more they apply a system, and after it's developed by itself, without the control. I mean, without to take a decision as a graphic designer, just using the typeface, and they will just develop. Is that probably a tip to give to the variable font well, fan? I, well, okay, so th it brings up a lot of issues, you know, this whole thing of making fonts that are variable. Uh, what, what good are they, and what, could you use them in this kind of context? And I think that's really unknown until we start. The, the things that I saw that were originally done were very primitive. They just use a really simple sans serif typeface. But uh, the truth is that, you know, the people have an investment in how these things feel and look, you know, as, as being somehow related to the actual content of the, of the material. And um, so we'll see. I, I just, I don't know how relevant that particular application of the thing is. But the applications of being able to choose a, a weight um, or a series of weights for a specific publication or application, I think that's potentially very useful. And w it's that we don't have experience in doing it, but um, I know from myself, from being able to do this on my own computer with my own typefaces, sometimes it's a really handy thing and it solves a graphic design problem for you. So, you know, a an example is, when, you're, when you've got a bunch of sans serif typefaces on the same page, but they're different sizes, how do they relate in weight? Well, sometimes it'd be really nice to have the smaller ones really look like the same weight as the bigger ones, but you don't always have the right thing to make that happen. But with this kind of application, you could, you could make it really fast. So. And I think there are a lot of other similar issues. You know, one of the problems that I still see all the time is from people printing dropped out material in a light color on a dark background. And it, it you know, it, in the printing process, you lose stuff. Um, and you can solve that very easily by a little variation in the thickness of the thin parts in the typeface. Then you have a thing that you can specifically use for dropping the type out. So. There, there are a lot of applications, I think, like that. And those are all things that I thought about when I first was trying to sell this idea of the multiple master fonts to Adobe. Um, yeah. Any more questions? You yeah. have one? Sumner, I'm curious to know. Um, we're all sort of starting our type design career and I feel like for me, I'll speak for myself, I have all these ideas rushing around in my brain for shapes that I want to get out of my head and put you know, into the computer. And I'm not trying to imply that you're <laughs> more towards the end of your career, but you are older than definitely some of us. Is that, if that's okay to say? you are. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so if you, <laughs> yeah. I'm curious to know what has maybe the curve looked like over the years for you um, for, for the ideas and shapes you have running around in your head that you want to create as a typeface, has that slowed at all over the years? Has it risen? Do you, have, do you still have an endless number of shapes you want to get out for yourself right now? I, I have sense. become much more experimental as, as I've gotten older and willing to put up with stuff that doesn't seem to work in the beginning but fiddling with it and see what will happen. And so I've made some pretty, uh, some typefaces that might dis surprise some people in recent years that nobody has really seen, a few people have seen. Um, and I, I don't know that it's really so much that I have shapes that I want to get out, but I, I am 
I am very interested in in the in the sort of malleable nature of the type and that video that you saw at the beginning was a thing that was actually I did for a project that never got used but um, you know the, I think we're just really at the beginning we're, we are in a very conservative time in typography uh, the sans serif typefaces are just keep spewing out and um, there, there's not much adventure really except in these classes and you know there's beginning to happen but it, it, it's it's slow so far so I don't know how long that will last how much adventure will will come out but uh, there's certainly plenty to do and there's plenty of interesting avenues to explore in typeface design and I think that's one of the things that's happening in in this type Paris environment and other places where typefaces are getting typeface design is getting taught and I, I you know one of the things I'm working on is a book about typeface design because I think this is not a fad that's going to go away I think it's going to just increase and one of the things that seems to be happening is that typeface design gradually is becoming a much more legitimate part of graphic design world you know I, I, I got my picture taken for print magazine with two other guys who are type designers in San Francisco uh, and they were taking pictures of graphic designers and I told these two young, younger guys I said guess what this never would have happened 20 years ago <laughs> that we got included as graphic designers just wouldn't have happened so there is some growth there you know so we'll see in echo to your question, I just realized that uh, you are the father of a very important step in technology with the help of a lot of people at Adobe, obviously. But So it seems that you take uh, the best of the technology to try to invent new forms who are based more and more to the most ancient time as possible. So you go in one direction with the technology, multiple master, optical size, uh, all these things, and, and you go in opposite direction as a source of, of design. So why is, uh, on, you say you were more traditional before, but in fact, you're going the other way. You, you go in two di direction completely reversed. Yeah. It's intentional or you ever think about that or it's well, just because I, you ever love yeah no this is a good question i you know I, I got very interested in the ancient roman letter forms from the whole experience of the trajan typeface becoming so popular and uh and i really wanted to learn more about it and the whole context of it and also what came before that where did it come from because we don't know that we don't even know who designed it but i think what you can conclude if you look at you know, the evidence is that it's very unlikely that a Roman designed that typeface. Very unlikely, because who made letters in the Roman world? Slaves made letters, or at best, freed men and freed women made letters. So, you know, I, it's, and tracing them back and finding those really old things, those old forms. Type designer to be good to be slaves. Fascinating, you know, <laughs> fascinating. So we, you know, letter forms in our tradition have a very low status. They started out being made by slaves. They're still kind of like that. <laughs> we don't get paid like architects do, for example, right? So, um, no, I, I, I also uh, am very interested in pushing the envelope about, and I hope I communicated that to some of you guys today, looking at your typefaces, in exploring other paths that we have not gone down. And I think we're right at the point where that may really start to happen, you know, that we begin to think about things in a different way. I did a workshop in Faenza. I had a small number of people, but what we did was I had them go out and take pictures the first morning of shapes. Uh, one woman took pictures of the shadows of the flags and then use those shapes to make letters. They did some amazing stuff. 
And I wanted them to stop thinking about the sort of traditional forms and start thinking about some other stuff about letter forms. And I showed them the cuneiform and how that evolved from pictures, modular forms, and so on. And I did another project earlier, last year, uh, in which we actually made up a writing system by starting out with pictures and then simplifying the pictures and ultimately coming up with a set of forms that are, that are, are unified in some way. So I, I think we are now at the point where we've got enough kind of energy behind what we're doing that we're going to start to see some of these things really turn into, you know, interesting and useful uh, developments in letter form. Thank you, Sumner, to give help for the future. So that's the end. Thank you, Sumner. And um, bye bye for the live stream. That's the last talk of the summer and we hope to see you next year or perhaps in the winter so bye bye